Big man thing. Everyone hates Tesla and SpaceX. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Let's go, America. We about to do it big. Four, three, two, Yo, look at the mother can we use? We got another one, man. Bombshell on Neuralink and Spaceship. Now, we're going to hop into a video. I was actually going to be Elon talking about just Neuralink and Starship. Now, guys, SpaceX is out here. It got wheels. All right. It got rockets. It's launching to the stratosphere. All right. I'm finna go to Mars and get some Mars baddies. You feel me? <laughs> I'm be the first. I'm be the first one to tap in on some honeys from outer space, multi-planetary pimping and player going on over here. <laughs> I'm a cop with shorty and a wife on Mars. <laughs> Talk about the passport bros, right? <laughs> I'm finna go to a different planet and cop with shorty, bro. Like I, I'm out here stunting on man's. So. <laughs> On a serious note, let's go back to the interview of Elon. And he's going to be dropping some bomb shells right here on Neuralink and Starship. And if you guys haven't heard about Neuralink, then you'll be brought up to speed in this one. So let's get it. Now, the internet providing ship, Starlink, is providing internet while Elon right now is sipping on a cup of water on the plane. So it has great connectivity. If you guys don't know, it's able to provide internet in rural places, but also when planes are flying and also to ships and carriers out on sea. So, I mean, it's going to be good for commerce and it's going to be good for also aviation. So let's get into it. Things that you said early on when you founded Neuralink, which has been amazing. Congratulations on that. I wouldn't put words in your mouth, but I would say it would be more along the lines, if you can't beat them, join them when it comes to merging neocortex and cloud. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm just curious what your thoughts are about what would drive that. I mean, adding adding that additional computational capacity and sensory capacity to the neocortex. Yeah, this is actually something that in banks in the culture books, which I really recommend everyone read. In the culture books, there's something called a neural lace. So all the humans have this neural lace that's essentially a high bandwidth brain to computer interface. And in the, in the, at least in the culture books, it's, the, it's so good that it actually retains all of your memories and kind of brain state. So even if your physical body dies, you can kind of be incorporated in another physical body and retain pretty much your original memories and brain state. I think it's a long way from that. Your original. Woo! Now, see, he said we're a long way from that, guys. Okay, so a couple of you guys are going to be scared out here. Not me. You know what I'm saying? My brain should not go with my body, all right? I got a fascinating brain. Most of you guys got normie. Y'all on normie time. Y'all on normie neurons, right? So it don't matter. Y'all get up out of here. Y'all don't need no... Y'all on normie norlink, right? For me, my brains need to be replicated on some hard drive. So, you know what I'm saying? You place me into the Optimus robot and I'm back at it, you know? <laughs> that would be crazy, man. But it's possible per science, right? And so that's pretty interesting, guys. But here we go. I know we're going to have people hating because they belong from the church. They didn't believe in airplanes. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't believe in cell phones because they thought it was the work of the devil. So we got those people, but we're just going to mush them to the side, right? Let's continue original memories and brain state. I think it's a long way from that. We only just had our first neural link with a human, which is going, it's going quite well. The, uh, the first patient is actually able to control their computer just by thinking. But like this first, the first product we call telepathy, where you can control your computer and phone and through your computer and phone almost a day, just by thinking. You just lie there. And I think that's, that's amazing, guys. I had a aunt and she was paralyzed to the same extent she could only move from her neck up. 
And for her to have access to that, for her to be able just to call me and still be able to use the laptop and the cell phone. I mean, she passed, you know, a decade ago, but for her or for this device to have been something that was available to her, man, that would have been amazing for her, right? She would have loved to have it. And so it's very fascinating as much as people will play around with being scared and saving their brain on a hard drive. Uh, on a serious note, this telepathy and what it's currently doing in this trial phase, it's, it's, it's very amazing. You know, now you might look over it because you got functioning hands and everything and you're all right. But uh, if you were paralyzed, you would want it. Right. So then you can go to Corn Hub and look up what you got to look up. There, I think, and you can move the, the, the mouse cursor a lot around the screen. The patient has agreed to do sort of like I think a live demo of just and he's part quadriplegic where he literally is just controlling the, the, the screen. He could like play video games, download software, like really anything you can do with a mouse just by thinking, which is pretty wild. It is pretty wild. I should say there's a long way to go from that to a full brain interface. So, a current neural link just has a thousand electrodes. I think ultimately. It needs something which which has you know probably a hundred thousand or, or a million electrodes. So these are very tiny electrodes. That they're tiny wires, way smaller than you. Hey guys, turn down your goddamn music when y'all edit. Right, the music is so loud. I really don't even get to hear what Elon's saying. But we're pretty far from the point where you're copying your brain on it. Okay, so we're just able to do what he showed on those examples, and then also that human was able to play video games. I know that there was photos of actually a human also being able to play video games with this kid again. So allowing those people to have some type of interaction with other humans via the electrical devices, um, it's just amazing. It's a good, it's a great thing, right? Uh, a fantastic day for humanism, not only just capitalism. They give it there. And you know, so there's this, I, I just want to emphasize a, a long way from where you like this today to having a whole brain interface, like, like the neural lace and the Ian Banks novels. But this is definitely physically possible. And you know, if you can't beat him, join him, you know, a human brain, which is, has a lot of constraints. We only have about maybe 10 watts of higher brain function. And we do a lot with our little 10 watts. It's not, you know, it's impressive, you know, that we've built a station with such a low power computer, really. It, it, it so, is, it, yeah. I, I, you know, I sort of think it's like, it's, it's not bad for a bunch of monkeys, you know? And we've all watched. And that's very interesting, too, guys, because actually, when you look at it, yeah, we don't use much of our brain. So he's talking about 10 watts. And so we have been able to build cities and we've been able to build Starship, right? The Starship from SpaceX and Starlink and Falcon 9s and not we, but a select couple of really smart people who actually use their brain to build such things. And everybody else, from people even who are even tradesmen, like the tradesmen who are the carpenters, the engineer, the welders. Like those are guys who are part of the story, too, right? Because. Those guys who are smart and build rockets, they need those engineers and the trademen to actually go out there and build it. And so net net, they work hand in hand. And those brains alone have been functioning on such a level that we've been able to create what we have been able to create. And especially the reason why I love at least electrical batteries, right? And us just being able, whether it's solar, wind, turbine, geothermal, uh, even just coal, even just oil, even burning, you know, nuclear. If we're using this energy, we still have to store it somewhere. And the battery revolution is definitely very interesting, electrical battery, because it provides somewhere to store that energy, regardless of how the energy is actually generated, solar and et cetera, like I told you, it needs to be stored somewhere. And so this next revolution of energy, which is essential to everyone, regardless if they're a household or business, you need energy. And so for us to have a, a position where we might be moving into a period of uh, abundance of energy is definitely interested. Uh, and we've been able to do that with a small computing power called our brain. So I always tell people the greatest natural resource is not gold. It is not oil. It's none of that. It's just your brain. It's a natural resource, guys. I watched you go from the, the Roadster to the Model 3 and Y and from Falcon 1 to Starship. So. I think going from the first implants to something that's got more capacity. Oh yeah, it's just a matter of if not a matter of when. Let's talk to. Yeah, let's I think I'll I'll put the you know, like I said you'll have kind of a whole brain interface that I guess is a sort of perhaps a form of immortality and that if it can kind of upload your brain state to 
you know, if your brain state is essentially stored, you're kind of backed up on a hard drive, I suppose, then you, know, you can always restore that brain state into a biological body or, or maybe a robot or something. But I, I want to emphasize again, it's like, you know, many years in the future, I, we're not breaking any laws of physics. Like, I think this is, this is probably something that will happen. The rate of we're, we're, we're building digital super intelligence, it may just be that we'll have digital super intelligence and it'll just solve the, solve the problem for us. But uh, in, in the meantime, uh, we'll keep progressing with our meat computers and uh, try to do as, do as good a job as possible. That's what I was going to say. The, uh, the tools that we have are growing at a super exponential rate that are making our linear projections of the future seem boring in some ways. Congratulations on Starship 3. Thank Amazing you. flight. Just really spectacular. Now, guys, this is what I showed you guys at the beginning. And man, we're really making... We're really making do. So shout outs to the people at SpaceX. Man, I wish I would have been there with those guys. But I think it's just not in my cards right now, right? Like somebody's got to be out here giving the information. And I think I could do that. Anybody could do with the job. Well, nobody could do it as good as me. But then they found a replacement. But to do what I do here, man, I think that's going to be important and necessary. And I love doing it. And it gives me freedom. Um, I would have been very restricted on doing that line of work. But net net at the end of the day, I served a lot of countries and missions at the end of the day. So I just want to hang that hat up and start a new chapter. And so anyways, with Everyone Hates Tesla and the world of opportunities, we're going to be moving in a different direction, but definitely exploration of space and what this rocket is doing and what that team is doing is great. But once again, this is the same company. If you guys watched the previous video that I did, and it'll be up here right on the video, I was talking about Elizabeth or Karen Warren, right? She was, or the government, excuse me, not specifically her, but also the government denied SpaceX $900 million, right? On their SpaceX grant. And they're out here doing the best job. Starship 3, come on. And we all saw uh, Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg last night. So that was great. And just, again, thankful for the work you do. You know, I, it's fascinating because I grew up at the late stages of the Apollo and into the... <laughs> and you see, these are the things that distract greatness. Get up out of here, man. Into the shuttle program. And I can't imagine that any government would be pushing space as rapidly and dramatically as you are. And so thank you for what you're doing there. I can say absolutely well I mean the, the, the goal of SpaceX is it's, it's just a, a much bigger goal than any government program which is to rockets and spacecraft that are people of making life multi-planetary so you know I mean step one is actually having that as a goal if you don't have that as a goal you're definitely not going to achieve it if you have it as a goal well now at least you have a chance of achieving it and this the thing about Starship is it is the the first rocket where Making life multiplanetary and to have, building a self-sustaining city on Mars is is at least possible. It's still obviously an immense amount of work, but it is the first rocket where that is success in, of, of, in making life multiplanetary is at least one of the possible outcomes. Yeah, I'm wondering if you're willing to venture a guess on when you'll be on the moon. I think pretty soon. I'd be surprised if, if it's longer than about three years to be landing starships on the moon. And because the progression of Starship is very rapid, you know, we're hoping to do at least another maybe five or six flights this year, and with each successive flight making significant improvements. So I think we've got a, a decent shot of achieving full reusability of both stages, booster and the ship, this year. And if not this year, I think, you know, knock on wood, it's like I think it's a very high probability of achieving full reusability next year, which. And that would be great because the Starship, guys, the payload that's able to be put on the Starship is vastly different than the Falcon 9. And so Starship is a big difference. And if they're able to achieve that and definitely be able to go back to the moon, this would be fascinating, right? This would be something no other country has the actual science and the technology to do. So remember, Russia was at the top when it came down to manufacturing these rockets. and now. Elon has taken the great blueprint and the great culture and systems of Tesla and systems of other businesses and applied the same assembly line and those skill sets to creating rockets. 
So he's producing rockets like he's producing cars. He's manufacturing them with the same level of efficiency. Of course, it's vastly different when you're building out a rocket, but I'm going to do a show later on that where you're going to actually be able to see how he's building out factories for the Starship. And it's very interesting, the process. And once again, guys, that's what I've always seen in the potential of Tesla. I've been able to extract and especially extrapolate the value, the IP of being able to actually make more effective and efficient processes. Regardless of what the actual product is, it's almost irrelevant. The culture and the company has a special IP that they do good at making the process better at whatever they do. Create mega batteries, those big power batteries for the power grid, creating vehicles, creating different types of vehicles that need different types of assembly line. Shout out to the CT, the Cybertruck. And being able to create reusable rockets. Like, it's just ridiculous. And so I'm going to do that video at a later point. But net-net, the processes, the IP of how to build out things with the, the machine that makes the machine is just extremely high at Tesla. It really is the fundamental breakthrough needed to make life multiplanetary. But for those that, for the, yeah, for those that, 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 that don't know the rocket industry that, that well, that, that they may not be aware that, that, that this is really the holy grail of rocketry, is full and rapid reusability. Because at that point, you're, you're, you're really just constrained by your propellant costs. And Starship, you know, uh, almost 80% of the propellant is liquid oxygen, which is very low cost. And then the, the fuel is met, there's sort of a little over 20% fuel, which is methane, also the lowest cost fuel. So if you have the full rapid reusability, then your actual cost per flight of, of Starship, even though it's it'll be capable of, we think, ultimately 200 tons to to orbit, will be maybe all the two million dollars of flight. I can't imagine anybody who's done a better job peering into the future. Unfortunately, we didn't get to hear to see how much that costs, but great points. That's what I'm talking about. They really just studied a process and saying, okay, who, what's the best fuel at the lowest cost, right? How can we make this? And of course, rapid reusability. And this allows the whole vehicle to still be utilized and reused versus being scrapped away or falls down and it just blows up. Like that's what the old rockets did. By actually creating the future. I'm curious, how far out do you think you're able to see? Many years out beyond today, given the speed of change. When things are changing rapidly, the, the ability to predict the future, I think, is becomes a lot harder because of the rate of change is so great. But I think some things are fairly obvious to predict, which is that we'll have AI or AGI that's at a level that it can really do any part of a task. It's just a question of when. One could debate, is it, you know, smarter than any even at the end of next year, or is it two years or three years? But it's not more than five years, that's for sure. So, yeah, you get the predictions. Uh, predictions I've, I'm sort of saying giving predictions of the 50th percentile of probability. So not, not like it will definitely happen, but if you say what, if you ask me like, what's the 50th percentile where it's like, if it would be, you know, your, your kind of over under is kind of even, that that's where I, why, why I think it's probably end of next year before AI can do better than any individual human could do. And then. Now look at these robots, cause you're gonna see Optimus Gen 2, I believe. Yeah, we're on Gen 2. This is Bumblebee, but I think this, no, this is actually Gen 2. So this was, no, Gen 1, Gen 1. So this is Gen 1. Now look at these robots in comparison to what you're going to see is Optimus Gen 2, possibly. But there's a, it's, a, it's a much higher bar to say, well, is this swap than, you know, human intelligence collectively? But if the rate of change continues, that, that's why I think probably 2029 or maybe 2030 is where it, digital intelligence will probably exceed uh, all human intelligence combined. And, and there, I think it's always helpful to look at these like fundamental ratios, you know, sort of physics first principles approach. So if you look at the ratio of digital to biological compute, so like let's say all of the higher level cognitive, if you sum up the higher level cognitive capacity of humans, mm -hmm. and then what is the, and think of that as compute, then well, and then compare that to what is the digital compute, and the rate at which this is growing is just boggles the mind. You know, I think 2029 20, or 2030 or thereabout, that's, I think, a reasonable time frame for where you'd expect the cumulative digital compute 
to probably exceed the cumulative biological compute of our so basically, let me summarize. The digital compute will be better than the biological compute. The biological compute is your guys' brain, right? That 10 watts from your brain. And so that in comparison to the digital compute and its ability to think it will exceed the digital compute or the biological compute, which is your brain, your human brain. Higher level brain functions. And then from, and, from then yeah. forever. Yeah. And still in, in, in dispatching and, and diverging forever. Yeah, and, and then, yeah, where do things go from there? I, I don't know, probably continuous. The, we are moving from, you say, if you look at the, like the limiting factors of, you know, the, what is the constraint on growth? Like last year, it was AI chips were the constraint on growth. Then this year, the, one of the biggest constraints on, on growth are voltage step down transformers, because, you know, the, just getting the power from like a utility at 300 kilovolts all the way down to below one volt for the computer is a massive amount of voltage step down. So it's, you know, my sort of very niche and perhaps not that funny joke is that we need transformers for transformers. So we need voltage transformer for AI you know, neural net transformers. But that is yeah, so that's very interesting. So the next constraint would be the transformers and taking that high voltage, right? And then bringing it down to something like a voltage of one. And so we need transformers for the transformers. That was his joke. But that's very interesting. And of course, the chips, which is the rave of what most people are talking about today, that was a constraint, but no longer as much of a constraint. And the net net, now we have transformers. And so there's other things that are a part of the process, but they're going to have to be innovated. There's going to have to be new creation. It's going to have to be more effective and efficient. So therefore it needs more innovation. And I think definitely people like SpaceX and Tesla and et cetera, uh, even shout outs to NVIDIA, will be able to bring that to the table, hopefully. That is literally the issue this year. And then if we're saying like next year and years beyond that, it's actually just, it's going to be a constraints on elect, like electrical power. And you've got both AI with very big demands for electrical power and the transition to sustainable energy with electric vehicles, and whatnot, also needing electrical power. So it's just a lot of electrical power needs. Electrical power needs, which is great for Tesla because Tesla creates mega packs. Right? It all lines up, right? So there's massive amounts of benefits and pros that are really coming out here. Like this is this is very exciting. And most people might not be excited. Most people are normies, right? So they're not really pegged in. Right. But net net at the end of the day, this is why this is all very exciting. Because with that being said, we're going to be building out that battery and the battery packs and the energy is necessary in order for what? In order for us to be able to tap into artificial intelligence, in order for us to be able to have energy. For the grid in order for us to have energy for the, not only just vehicles but anything else that we're utilizing and so the digital compute will need more electric power and then also he talked about those transformers now i still think there's some constraints on the chips for sure because at this point the only company that's out there really killing it and has the majority of the market is tsmc and i think congress just recently approved a good amount for Intel, so Intel can continue to build out their foundries. And I think Intel is a possibly good long-term play just because of the massive amounts of funding that is actually being promoted for them, of course, because we're trying to at least have some ability to produce a good amount of supply for the market for semiconductors. And though, you know, as we already know, your guys out there are just killing it. Your guys are killing it. Uh, TSMC is killing it. So everybody likes to hate Tesla, but Tesla brings massive amounts of things to the actual table. And this is why I don't even go back and forth all day on the EV topic, because when we talk about actual vehicles, there's still amounts of amounts of batteries that we still need to talk about. And this is where I see the massive amounts of add value in the next sector. And it's way higher margins. We're talking the video margins on these battery packs, on these mega packs these have margins that match nvidia and there is no competition there's a lot of people that also make chips like amd and etc 
But there, it, it, AMD in the video, guys, let's get this clear. They don't make those chips. It's all TSMC. They just design and then also they resale. But touch of the designs, manufacturers, and sells these batteries, and they have the same margin. So we control vertical integration. We have the vertical integration. And as you heard from Elon himself, this is the sector that's going to actually need to be developed so that we can provide that energy for all those things that are going to require energy. This is why I say uh, it doesn't get, you're not going to get far hating on Tesla. You're really not. With everything that we've just seen from uh, Starlink, or excuse me, Starship, and then Neuralink, you guys, we're just dropping bombshells on you. I mean, every time we watch these videos, I just get a feeling that it's a... A fantastic day for capitalism. It's a great day. If you guys continue to watch these shows and you like them, please let me know in the comment sections. Shout-outs to the great red, white, and blue. Shout-outs to America. Shout-outs to those people who love to hate Tesla. But most importantly, shout-outs to the... <laughs>